Good evening. Hello. And a big welcome here to tonight's 5 by 15. And I couldn't be more thrilled by the lineup we've got tonight. I'm truly excited to hear every single speaker that we've got. And I know that you're going to have a really great hour and a quarter, hour and a half ahead of you. Um, as ever, the speakers are going to speak for 12 to 15 minutes and all the details of all their amazing books are going to be in the chat. So with no further ado, because I'm going to introduce them to you one by one, I'm going to kick straight off with introducing you all to Paula Byrne, who is a fantastic biographer of various people, mostly women, I would say, who are thinking about the adventures of Miss Pym and the genius of Jane Austen. A particular book of hers that I really loved was about John Kennedy's sister, who was known as Kick, who married into the English aristocracy and then had an extraordinary, extraordinary story. You fly through the pages. Now Paula has turned her laser sharp, brilliant uh, eye towards the women in Thomas Hardy's life. Now people often write about the women that Thomas Hardy writes about, poor old Tess and all those different people. But Paula's gone behind the scenes to look at the women that he lived with and related to. So Paula, welcome to 5 by 15. It's great to have you here and over to you. Thank you, Rosie, for that very kind introduction. I'm so happy to be here. A bit nervous about being the first, but anyway. Um, so I'm going to start at the beginning, the inspiration for the book about Hardy women. And it began with a, a pilgrimage to um, Max Gate, which is the house that Thomas Hardy um, built for himself after he'd become fairly famous. Um, so I'm going to share a slide with you here. Um, and I wanted to just share this moment of, of the inspiration of the attic room. So I had the tour around Max Gate and it was as suitably gloomy as you'd expect and dusty. And it was incredible really to see the room that Tess was, was, was written, composed in. But the room that really captured my imagination was the attic room. Probably I'm you know, a huge fan of Jane Eyre. So I instantly think of mad women in the attic. Um, and when we were shown around Emma's, Emma Hardy, Tom Hardy's first wife's attic room, she had two rooms. You can see one of the rooms here. Um, it really fired my imagination. It really made me want to know more about why she went up and lived in the attic. She did so for 14 years. Now, at the time, I did not know that his second wife, Florence, also ended up banishing herself to the attic, which seems really unfortunate that not one but two wives would would do so um but they did so I was really intrigued by um the story behind Emma and then later Florence so that was that moment of inspiration I didn't really know what I was going to do at the time I just thought well, I want to just know a little bit more about Emma's story so that really was the inspiration um and then I had another sort of, it was almost like a day vision. I was um, thinking a lot about Martha Brown and Martha Brown was the woman whom Thomas Hardy saw executed um, when he was just 16. He was sitting in the front row um, in Dorchester and he'd made quite a special effort to, to go and see this woman being hanged. And it was a very erotic, strange erotic experience for Thomas Hardy, um, partly because um, her dress it was raining and her dress clung to all her contours of her body um and I had this sort of day vision I could always hear the rain the August rain and see Martha Brown's face and Thomas Hardy was quite obsessed with this story he would talk about it even up until he was in his 80s he said the executioner's mask that was put over her face this white linen mask was see-through because of the rain so you could see her features she was very beautiful and she wore her best dress for her execution, her black silk dress. Um, because of the rain, it really molded the, to the curves of her body. So he found it a very sort of shameful, erotic, it, almost exhilarating experience. And also he felt full of guilt and shame and remorse. Um, so that day vision was, I knew that would be the prologue. I thought I, this seems such a vivid place to start. And it also struck me at that time that the one thing we don't, see in, in the great test of the d'Urbervilles is Tess's ex execution that is off stage so we don't see that and to me it felt as though Hardy just couldn't really revisit the pain of that moment that really sort of tormented and tortured him 
So it was, I had those two vignettes really, the, the attic room, the mad woman, was she mad? Some people said Emma was mad and um, was she another Bertha Mason shut up or what was the story? But then my research took me to other stories. Um, I'm putting up a slide here of Thomas Hardy's mother, Jemima, and his sister's uh, his sister, Kate. I think quite a few of us who like Hardy know about his relationship with his mother. He adored his mother and he explores this incredibly close relationship in The Return of the Native and in other ones, uh, novels. And she was a really a force of nature, formidable. She, as you can see her there, she's reading a book. She always literally had her nose in a book. And the painting that you see in front of you was painted by Thomas Hardy's eldest sister, Mary, who was a, who was a really, she was an amateur painting painter, but we never see her paintings, we never hear her voice. So I was very keen to restore the voice of the sisters. On the on, on my right hand, um, you'll, you'll see um, Kate Hardy, who was Thomas Hardy's younger sister, who was also a school teacher like his sister, Mary. And he used these the, the lives of these women who were school teachers, and they were hard, hard lives, uh, inspired him to write the character of Sue Brighthead, who's one of my uh, personal favorite Hardy heroines. Um, and his second wife, Florence, was also a school teacher. And he doesn't glamorize the lives of a trainee teacher or a school teacher. And Thomas Hardy's sisters had really difficult lives. So I really love digging deep into the lives of what it what is it like to be a rural school mistress and we're lucky enough that fairly recently one of the log books in mary's school has been rediscovered so it was i was it was very very gripping reading for me because it was a real a real sense of what the day-to-day -day life was like in in a school room where half the time the children aren't there because it's harvest or, or they have to look after the baby baby so in the log book it would say there's wonderful excuse like looking after the baby so missed school um so I was really, really fascinated and intrigued by their lives. And it really, it became a very personal book for me. And I, I think to some extent, you know, all, all biography is autobiography. Um, I, I'm very interested in the lives of working class women. It's my own background. Um, I, I think often um, working class women's voices are not sufficiently heard. So I was very keen to restore some of that, to really get a sense of what it was like. And most of the women in Th Thomas Hardy's lives, well, they were hard grafters and they often did extra jobs to supplement the family income. So they would, so Thomas Hardy's mother, for instance, was a very good seamstress, as indeed were many of his family and cousins. And she would embroider gloves and she would make dresses. So I'm always very interested in people say, oh, women didn't really work or they were raising babies. Well, no, that's not true. Actually, most women took in some kind of work. So I really wanted to get their, their voices across. Um, so that was really very sort of important to me, telling their stories. Um, the next slide, and just, just really reflecting on that, um, what does it mean when we talk about family law, L-O-R-E, not law? Um, I'm again fascinated by the way that women tell stories and they get they come down through families. Just one instant in Thomas Hardy's life was um, he had a secret affair with a woman you see in front of you. Her name is Eliza Nichols. And for years, scholars did not believe this woman and her descendants who said, my grandmother was engaged to Thomas Hardy. He jilted her. He gave her a ring and people dismissed her story. And it wasn't until fairly recently that we discovered indubitably that the story was true. And that was because one of his religious books surfaced in which he'd written annotations and it's beyond doubt now. But I'm fascinated by the fact that people tend not to believe women's stories. They say, oh, it's just family gossip. But it's my experience that when we have these secrets in families, families don't talk about them very much in a gossipy manner. It's something to be ashamed of. Um, and in a way, that's something that Hardy really exploits in Tess of the D'Urbervilles um, with the whole idea of the illegitimate servant girl who's been seduced by an aristocrat and how that affects the family. Um, and I've just put up a poem. I'm not going to read it. I don't have time. I'm keeping to time carefully. So, But it's a beautiful poem about the breakup of um, the relationship with Eliza Nicholl. And it's a, it was a sonnet sequence, the, the sonnet sequence that he wrote 
about Eliza and it's told from the perspective of Eliza. So it's called the She to Him Sonnets and he destroyed most of them, but there's five or six left and they are superb poems and he wrote them when he was 25. And it's always, he's doing the breaking up and she is the, at the receiving end, but it's entirely from her point of view. And I love the way Hardy can do that. He treated some of the women in his life incredibly badly, but he wrote about them so sympathetically. And I think this was just the kernel, the paradox really of what I was trying to do was to try and discover what, why did he treat women so badly, but then write about them so powerfully. So that, that was Eliza. So quickly coming to the two Hardy wives, Emma and Florence. So Emma in the um, sky blue, air blue dress, sky blue dress, um, when he courted her in that dress makes an appearance in A Pair of Blue Eyes, which is the novel that's about their courtship in, um, in Cornwall. And again, because his mother was a seamstress, there was always dresses around in the house. He, would, he just had such an acute eye for women's clothes. And I love that in the novels, how he writes very specifically about dress. You know, we think of Tessa's white muslin dress with the red ribbon in her hair, or we think of Bathsheba's scarlet red uh, riding jacket, or Elfrida's sky blue uh, blue, sometimes sky blue, dress. It is real, this is a man who was around a lot of clothes and, and, and was very susceptible um, to female clothing. And then there's Florence, um, who was much, much younger than Hardy. He really did move her in when en er uh, Emma had gone up into the attic. Um, and um, quite recently, we've had some new letters um, surfaced from, um, uh, from Florence, which... Um, Many people have said, oh, you know, what kind of relationship was it? Well, it was clear from these letters that have recently been discovered that they had a really incredibly romantic, intense sexual relationship. It wasn't just a caretaker looking after an older man. So there's been some new evidence, new letters come to life. So, again, I'm really trying to get inside the head of these women and tell their stories. And I'm just going to move on to the final muse um, who was Gertrude Bugler, and she was this incredibly beautiful woman who played the part of Tess for the Hardy players. And Hardy first met her when she played the part of Marty South when she was 16 for the Hardy players. And he didn't know at the time that she was the daughter of the woman who inspired Tess of the Devil, the real woman who was a milkmaid called Augusta, who was incredibly beautiful. And you can see here how beautiful her daughter is. So Hardy fell hard for the last muse who was Gertrude who was only 16 many many years younger than him but became quite obsessed and this gave a lot of pain to Florence Hardy's second wife so much so there was a huge scene when Florence went to see um, Gertrude Bugler and begged her to stay away from her husband um, because she felt that her husband's obsession was was harming their marriage and harming themselves so I really wanted to tell Gertrude's story too um, and, um, and, and, and see things from her point of view. So that was the idea of the story. I hope I've given justice to those women's voices, that, those invisible women who didn't really have a chance for their voices to be heard. Um, so thank you for listening. And, and if you do, you're a hardy lover. If you're not a hardy lover, I hope you enjoy the book. Thank you. Thank you. What a great, what a great um lead in to what extraordinary stories. I mean, I suppose writers always had had that kind of hold over women. I mean, you could be talking about a Norman Mailer character or a whole lot of people, the way you described that. I love the stuff about the clothing as well. I hadn't realised just what a keen eye he had. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And as I say, the, the book and all of all other all other books are really worth getting. Um, our next speaker tonight is a no stranger to us at 5 by 15. It's Jackie Morris, who's joining us from an attic, but we're not going to see much of Jackie beyond what we see at the moment. Jackie uh, is incredibly well known, mo mostly for the extraordinary book, The Lost Spells and the um, Lost Words that she co-wrote with Robert McFarlane. And they are going to do another one called The Lost Birds. And when I was asking Jackie what it was she was going to do tonight, and I said, is it like a synopsis for a new book? And she said, well, no, not really, because it's impossible to figure out what it's about. And then she said that when she and Robert were putting together the idea of The Lost Words, which is a if you haven't seen it, please go and get it. Um, it was kind of indescribable until they sat down and actually 
created this extraordinary big illustrated book, which is about words that got lost and was triggered by the fact that a new dictionary came out in which lots of words that lots of us grew up with were deemed to be boring and unusable. Now, I'm not sure how much you're going to see Jackie after this moment, because this is part of, part of prayer, part of meditation, and it's about peace that we so desperately need. So Jackie, welcome back to 5 by 15. Thank you for joining us and um, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I am in my attic and I am a mad woman, uh, but I don't have a husband, um, which feels quite good sometimes. Um, I do have a lovely partner, though, who's very supportive. Um, anyway, this is about peace. And I will try not to gabble, and I hope that it brings you 15 minutes of peace and thought. I thought that living would get easier the older I became. Not true. Perhaps, I thought, as I learned the rules for living and how to behave, that I would settle into my fragile shell of skin. And if there are moments of silence in this, do not adjust your set, just look at the images of doves, because sometimes images are easier for me than words. There should be silence between words, and the doves will keep you company. My child's mind learned of war through television, through history, and it seems that there's always the stories of war that we tell, seldom the stories of peace. The accident of my birth made me fortunate. I grew and have lived in a peaceful place so far. And yet in 62 years around the world, so many wars and so much conflict. But now, more than ever, how broken the world feels and the grief and the sorrow wrap a web around the world. So why are the stories of peace so hard to tell? And where are the great epics of peace? And what is the use of art in a fractured and broken world? And therefore, what is the use of me? When a fire burns inside my mind, I paint pigment, paper, water, calm my soul, still my mind, bring focus to scattered thought. Painting becomes ritual, painting becomes prayer, and these days all the prayers, all of them, for peace, and hope moves through every image, white, pure, flight, freedom, a symbol of peace, a symbol of hope, strength in the fragility of wings as they fly in the world's winds and onto paper, until I begin, maybe, to understand their shape and paint a flock to fly around the world. Picasso too found peace in paint. He lived through wars, through desperate times. And when young, his rivalry with Matisse was bitter, a fight, each with their own idea, beauty of art. But as they grew, rivalry became friendship. Late in life, Matisse gave his beloved doves to his beloved friend. Their dove, painted by Picasso, became an emblem for peace in 1949, the poster for the Peace Symposium, which opened on the 24th, 23rd of April in 1949, when his daughter Paloma, who he named after the dove, was born. I search for peace to write to the peace, knowing that I have so many questions, knowing that I have no answers, and the more I search, the more elusive peace does seem to be, and it does seem a vain, naive, indulgent act making art in these times. Toni Morrison spoke of creativity in troubled times. She said, this is precisely the time when artists go to work. There is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That's how civilizations heal. 
Selena Gordon said, pessimism is for lightweights. Hate speaks with a loud voice. War is a bully, a thief, violent, destructive, chaotic, ugly. And I am naive, but not arrogant enough to believe that I could write a great epic of peace. And yet, as doves and wings and the peace of wild things dominate my thoughts, I would like to try to craft a book with words and images that might become a place where others could find peace, even for a moment, that could be a talisman to carry in pocket, that could be a small book of prayers for peace. Already I've learned so much, and the more I learn, the more difficult the task. As a species, we're hardwired to learn through stories. Politics, news, inflates the idea of conflict. Seldom hear stories of peace. The only people who profit from war are those who would make and sell weapons, and their bank accounts grow heavy with the blood of innocence but heavier still than this are the smallest, the coffins. So many small lives stolen from all of us, so many futures ended by the hatred of a few, by the actions of a few, because of fear, because of hate, because of war. We need new ways of thinking. We need to look to others for lessons. Everything that will be in the human world first needs to be imagined before it can come to be. And if peace is a state of mind, then it needs memory to thrive, justice to grow, forgiveness, reconciliation, and love to blossom, and courage to share. We need to see our place in this world in a different light if we're to cease making war on each other and on the fragile planet on which we live. And yet, even on a personal level, I find that I'm conflicted within, at war with myself, uneasy, restless, aggressive, challenged. I'm too quick to anger and to meet anger with anger and too slow to listen and have so many lessons to learn. From trees, I can learn how to give space to others. Trees have a wisdom that we lack. The biggest tree in the forest doesn't hoard and hoard more and more. Instead, they give. They give shelter and shade. They give food. They give breath. They give home to many small lives, and they depend on other lives to flourish, but they don't exploit to survive. It's Lent, I think, at the moment, and for Lent the Pope suggests that we should fast, and his words ring true when he says, fast from anger and be filled with patience. But how can we not be angry when we see the ravages of war? So I try to turn the anger into finding peace in the hope that it will help others. And I try to turn that anger into painting doves in the hope that they will help others to find peace. And I try to turn that anger into asking questions and seeking answers in the hope of finding peace. He also suggested that we fast from words and be silent so that we may listen. Mm, I need to do that. I try to speak without fear, and if I get things wrong, then I'm sorry, and I hope to learn. And though these days I hope to learn more from wild things, as humans seem to be so filled with folly, that even when we feel ourselves to be so wise, I feel we're not. And I do so need to fast from words and listen. So I ask, Imagine peace. What does peace mean for you? What's the word for peace in your mother tongue? What does peace look like? Where do you find peace? These are some of the places that I find peace. In the flight of birds, in the green light beneath trees, in the sound of wind moving over land, 
in the star patterns that move with time in the darkest of skies, in the summer scent of horses, sunshine on warm coats, in the scent of blossom from wild flowers, unexpected honeysuckle on a cliff top, when reading something beautiful, especially poetry, when painting beside the sea in the patterns of light and water, walking in the wild and also sometimes in cities, knitting, making food for friends to share, especially bread for the magic of it. In the arrival of swallows in spring, far travellers, imagining their journey over land, over sea, in bird song, in the language of birds, today in the voices of skylarks rising in the blue, in trees, their shaken spring with fresh leaves unfurling, blossom green, then the burning bright autumn leaves and how bird song becomes richer in spring. In the rarity of being still with a calm mind, in beautiful art, in beautiful music, in the sound of a cello, beneath a thousand year old yew tree as twilight and the bats awake and take wing and set off into the dark, but also any time beneath a thousand year old tree. And all of this, all of these words can be summarized with just a few words. Please cease fire now. Jackie, thank you so much. That was um, completely wonderful. But I still see we're getting some more pictures. I do find it easier to paint than to write. Well, they're, they're quite astonishing. They are so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing them. Um, Everyone who's listening, um, first of all, you can buy these prints. The details are in the chat. And also, if you can, make donations to Medicine Sans Frontier. Um, there's very, um, you have to imagine something to have it. As you say, we have to write about and imagine periods of peace. There is much more writing about war. War reporters are still very honoured in our society. It's quite, oh. um, thank you, thank you. And whatever this turns out to be, it will be wonderful. Um, so, thank you. Now, our next speaker is no stranger to talking about wars. Um, Kathy Newman is one of the lead presenters of Channel 4 News, which is, well, I would say the best news programme on the telly at the moment. And hey. <laughs> <laughs> he has had lots of scoops, in, including all lots of seedy stuff that's happened in um, in Westminster, as well as being the only journalist who travelled to the Congo to report on the sexual violence when Angelina Jolie was doing that. And Cathy is also in her kind of spare time, uh, has a wonderful series where she interviews women about how they got to where they've got to. And she's called this series and the subsequent book, The Ladder. So I'd like to start off because just the fact that you call it The Ladder means mm. we're still climbing. Yeah, I, I mean, the ladder in a way, I'm sort of a bit tongue in cheek, um, because, as you'll know from from reading the book, a lot of the women who I interview say, well, the best thing about a career ladder is not to think of it as a ladder, because actually, it's not A to B and, you know, straight up the rung and you're toiling up to the top. Um, because most successful women have had quite a circuitous route to the top. Um, and I find that quite reassuring because, for example, Nisha Katona, who founded Mowgli Street Food, which mm -hmm. is an amazing chain of restaurants, I absolutely love it. And she talked about how, you know, she was a bit of a disappointment to her parents because she didn't study what they wanted her to study. And then she ended up sort of trying to be a barrister, but it wasn't really for her. And then she sort of hit on the fact that it was food and you know, being an entrepreneur that got her going. And so she set up Mowgli Street Food and, and now she's an incredibly successful um, entrepreneur and, and restaurateur. So I, I just found that very reassuring that actually it's about sort of just like enjoying what you're doing and getting immersed in what you're doing. And, you know, hopefully if you're passionate about something and you love what you're doing, then you'll be better at it. And so you'll progress up the ladder without even thinking of it as a ladder. But I suppose your point is, is the ladder easier for men than it is for yeah. women? And I suppose that's 
um, what I'm alluding to in the subtitle about dodging the snakes, because, um, yeah, I think there are more snakes who are going to tip you off your perch for a woman than there are for men. And I think that's still the case. And particularly if you're a woman of, woman of colour, you know, there are more hurdles you've got to, sorry, I'm mixing my metaphors now, but more hurdles you've got to surmount on your way up the ladder. And I think that is still the case. Yes. And I mean, I would say also that uh, the whole issue of having children is, I don't want to call it a snake, but it's without a doubt a very big break in the ladder and one that as a society, I think we're not very good at dealing with. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the pram in the hall um, yeah. was always seen as the kind of impediment to literary success. Well, it can be an impediment to female success. But I think that was interested me as well, because from my own personal experience, you know, I've got a very supportive husband and, you know, he I absolutely couldn't do what I do without his support. And I found it interesting that a, a great many women in the book, like Brenda Hale, for example, yes. She credits her husband for helping her propel her up the ladder. Um, and I always think the first women's lib conference, the men did the childcare. And I love that, um, mm -hmm. you know, because I think that you've got to be a team and you've got to have male allies. And that male ally might be your husband in, in my case, or it may be. And also in my case, you know, many people at work who, um, you know, are male supporters of propelling women up to the top. And I think that's that's crucial. And I mean, I, I started Spare Rib magazine, which is now, I have to say, 51 years old. Um, it's a very long time. And, you, and by you the have... way, you were in my first book. <laughs> That's right. As a I bloody don't... brilliant woman. <laughs> no, yeah. But I, there's, a, there's a line in your in your book, you know, about saying about how you write in your, and I'm going to quote it, but you take it for granted. Women take it for granted that they can be judges, doctors and lawyers and anything they want. Now, I mean, 50 years ago, you couldn't take any of that for granted. Mm. Um, so we have gone a long way up the ladder. But I also, I also think that um, in a way that now women can be all sorts of things, we never really redefined what men could be. And I think yeah. that's been a very big problem. I think that's really interesting. And I think that, I think I end the book with Mary Beard being very optimistic and actually you wouldn't necessarily expect her to be optimistic given you know all the trolling she's had online and so on and i do talk about that in the book as well that you know that is a, a challenge um that you know a lot of women have and girls particularly you know our our daughters our granddaughters you know have today that we didn't have and that is that horrible social media world mm -hmm. that they've got to navigate and a lot of the hurdles that previous generations of women faced in real life they're now facing online you know subsequent generations um but yeah redefine what a man is I think that's a really interesting point and I think that comes back also to I do a lot of talks at schools and I um go in to talk to boys and girls and I think that young boys are, are struggling with a lack of mm -hmm. male role models and I think we have brilliant young girls have amazing female role models now which is another reason for optimism that Mary Beard would cite I'm sure um but I think there is an issue with male identity male role models and yeah as you say how what what where where is the the man in this space and I think it's also I thought about this a lot with um my job and interviewing mm. and so on and when I first became a presenter I kind of thought I had to do it like the men do it and you know that was very aggressive interviewing and you know really sort of pugnacious Jeremy Paxman style because that's kind of what I grew up with mm -hmm. but then I realized that actually that wasn't always what people wanted these days. You know, they want a variety of presenting styles and actually they quite like it if as a woman, you're able to tease something more out of someone by being a bit less adversarial. So that I think could be maybe the definition of what men and women do is much more fluid now and much more subtle than, um, than it has been in the past and much less sort of binary. I'm not getting into gender politics and that, but just, you know, just a little more shades of grey than we've had in the past. I think that's really interesting. I mean, one of the things that I thought was fascinating and a bit depressing about the whole COVID inquiry was the idea that the people who were formulating the lockdown rules were young men who'd been to Eton and who had no children, who were just sitting around thinking that they could just say, well, shut the schools. Yeah. Without thinking of, you know, what that actually meant to a mother who was going to be the one who picked up the slack. And 
do you think that you know you can't you need do you think we're at tipping points where there's enough feminine emotional yeah. intelligence that's around to make these kinds of differences well i think and also helen mcnamara who was a senior civil servant during, yes. made the point to the inquiry that no one thought about what would happen to domestic violence and rates of domestic mm -hmm. violence if you basically kept people at home and obviously we know tragically that the results were that more women got beaten up um, at home and but and that was because as you say there were too many old Etonians but also just too many men making the decisions and I think I think we're at a tipping point in certain industries but I think politics is actually getting more problematic because um, and you know this is also again partly because of social media that a lot of women now bright women don't want to go into politics because yeah. it's just too toxic and why would you if you can make a good living you've basically got to do it for love and a sense of duty which some people have and that's brilliant but you know actually the the kind of tax on on your own personal well-being but also your well-being of your family you know we've seen I don't know if Tobias Elwood has got targeted recently at his home mm. and um, you know, he's a man. And so men do in politics, it's pretty hostile terrain for them, too. But it's even more hostile for women. And whatever you think of her politics, it is a fact that Diane Abbott was kind of trolled a, a zillion times more than anybody else in the quite the most appalling way because she was black and she was a woman. So, you know, that I think that is a real issue that we're grappling with and politicians are trying to deal with social media by regulating it. And, you know, so the tech giants are kind of waking up to the fact that parents of murdered children and, you know, children who have taken their own lives are, you know, the genie has been let out of the bottle in, in a way that is having massive implications for society, but for politics and also for women's participation in in the democratic process, which is, yeah, I mean, I don't know what the answer is to that, but it, it's it's a massive issue that we're confronting at the moment. Yes, and you you think of how people like, well, both Angela Rayner and Jess Phillips, and those people who I think are amazing role models for mm. women. And But then you also think, uh, if your daughter said, I want to go be a female MP at the moment, you'd be thinking, really? Yeah. Especially yeah. if... They want to have children. It's very, uh, very scary that. And yeah. I'm not quite sure at the moment how we fix it. Uh, rather, you know, if you can't get masses of women in to tip that balance. I think you can only fix it when we've dealt with the problem of social media, AI, you know, the tech giants not taking control of what is on their platforms. And, you know, we're pretty tightly regulated as broadcasters. And sometimes that can be quite um, challenging if you want to put out a story about um, someone who doesn't particularly want you to say various things about them, which may well be true, but they could take you to court and bog you down for years in court. That's another issue we're not getting on to right now, slaps, no. for example. But, um, but you know, that, that until the tech giants can sort of assume some of the same responsibilities that we have to have as broadcasters, I don't think you're going to make the world a sort of more benign place for women to participate in politics. For example, it's a sort of un, unseen, cons unforeseen consequence of, of letting that social media giant out of the bottle, the, the genie out of the bottle. So who's, who's really inspired you in your life? I mean, I know from my point of view, when I was young and I was doing Spare Rip and someone said, you should go and talk to Martha Gellhorn. And mm. I thought, oh my God, how amazing. And you know, they said, oh, she'll write to a spare rib. And I, I remember going round and being completely in awe. I was very young. And I said, would you write for it? And Martha said, I never write for anything that's women's liberation. I mean, I <laughs> do it wow. And I oh, that's crushing. I know. I mean, we did subsequently become great friends for the rest of her life. But it was such an extraordinary moment of, mm. because everything about feminism then was about sort of sisterhood. And mm. I think that does still exist, but I think it's incredibly important, the feeling of, you know, what you do in your in your podcast as well as in this book is lay open other people's lives and the difficulties, yeah. the triumphs that they've had. Yeah, what I what I love about it is that there is I think there is a much better sense of sisterhood now. And you know, I pay tribute to pioneers such as yourself because it wasn't it, it was it's much easier for subsequent generations. And even when I started work, 
there was that thing of like the women who were at the top didn't necessarily want to send the elevator back down as the saying goes now i think there's really very much a culture of women ha- women helping each mm. other and you know i mentor lots of young women and i think that's really important and i think there is that sense of a much more of a network because we've seen the, the the men having the networks and we think right we'll do that because there's a power in a network um but yeah to who's inspired me i mean I know this sounds corny, but I am inspired by every single woman I interview on this on mm. this thing because, um, you know, Anne Oliverius, to name one, you know, pioneering feminist lawyer, she talked about it, sends shivers down my spine even when I think about it. She talked about how her mum was constantly abused by um, her father. And when she was still a teenager, one time her father went to hit her mum again. And she, as a teenager, basically stood between them and said, don't hit her, hit me. And when you do, I'm going to call the police and I'm going to press charges. And he didn't hit her. And that was the last time that he hit her mum. And I just think how incredible and how inspiring that someone who was that teenager then went on to, you know, be such a pioneer and a trailblazer. And I could give you any number of examples. The same, you know, Tawakol Karman, who's an incredible activist, who's, you know, we've been talking a lot about Alexei Navalny recently, I mean, she is sort of the equivalent in terms of a female activist and campaigner and um, just the number of times she's been put in jail and risked jail simply to protest for the freedoms that we all take for granted. So, yeah, um, I mean, I mean, Rosamund Adukasi Deborah, another woman I've interviewed Mm -hmm. for the book, turned, you know, incredible tragedy of her child Ella being killed and how she, well, she died of an asthma attack and how she then turned that tragedy into ensuring that air pollution was put as cause of death on her certificate. And she's now become a global campaigner um, against air pollution. And she's got Arnie Schwarzenegger sort of ringing her up and sort of giving her help and campaign tips and asking her for campaign tips. So, you know, yeah, I, I have so many inspirational women that I speak to every week. It's a real privilege to do it. Well, thank you very much for sharing that and there are lots of amazing women in Cassie's book that are really great to read about and we do need role models especially nowadays to help us forward and I completely agree with you about Rosamond she is amazing and she really has Mm. changed laws and changed the way that the world thinks about this unseeing poison that hangs all around us and it's very very impressive it's simply awful that it took such a tragedy to make that yeah. happen but my god I do admire her courage um, and thank you so much for finding the time to do this terrific book for all of us and thank for you anyone whose daughter needs um, a thought or any age um, go and get it so thank you Kathy that was absolutely great. Um, so our next speaker, again, we're going somewhere pretty different, but again, it's a, a, um, this is a rip-roaring story that won this year's Bailey Gifford Prize. And it's the story about the fire at Fort McMurray in Canada. And this was a fire like no other. This was a result of greed and oil and climate change and all the things that well, certainly here at 5 by 15, but all of us um, worry about. And in a way, so many of the big themes and the reasons behind what's happening today came together in this particular strange Canadian town. And this book written by John Balliard, uh, as I say, won the Bailey Gifford and won all sorts of other awards, is a fantastic read that reconstructs what happened on a more or less day by day, hour by hour basis. And I kid you not, you pick it up and you can't put it down. So I'm thrilled that John is joining us from Vancouver to tell us about about the story of Fort McMurray and what happened. And his extraordinary book is called Fire Weather, Do Get It. John, over to you. Uh, Thank you so much, Rosie and Jack. Uh, and everybody, really, really good to be with you uh, today. Um, it's still morning for me, so you're way ahead of me. And I, I hope you're all having a good day because, um, you know, you're in the future. Uh, uh, so uh, fire weather uh, intruded uh, into my life on May 3rd, uh, 2016. And I, I made the mistake of, of looking at Twitter when I was actually in a really beautiful Italian uh, writer's retreat working on a novel. 
And uh, and so Twitter shouldn't be allowed in such places. And yet there I, I looked at it and this uh, city, Fort McMurray in northern Alberta, was completely shrouded in black smoke. And uh, Fort McMurray isn't really known to people outside of Canada or North America. And it's it is the largest source of foreign petroleum imports into the United States. Uh, they just broke four million barrels a day of production. Uh, it's about 600 miles north of the U.S. border and 600 miles south of the Arctic Circle. It's uh, deep in the boreal forest, very isolated place, sitting on top of a gigantic bitumen deposit. Bitumen is not oil. It is tar. And in order to render it into something that an American petroleum company will want to buy, you have to burn billions of cubic feet of natural gas every day to process this stuff into something uh, usable. Um, it caught on fire. The, the, the petroleum plant didn't, but the city of roughly 100,000 people where all the workers live was overrun uh, by a wildfire on the afternoon of May 3rd, initiating the largest, most rapid evacuation due to fire in modern times. And this is what came across my Twitter feed on May 3rd. And I'm looking at this and uh, because Fort McMurray occupies such an outsized uh, role in, in the Canadian consciousness, because so much money is generated there and the, the wages are so massive, it really touches the whole country kind of the way Silicon Valley touches uh, the whole United States. So um, it was frightening to see the city disappear, to see these ant-like trails of cars uh, crawling down the, the, the single highway out of the city. Uh, everything was going at this glacially slow pace because everybody was evacuating at once. There was no understanding of who is left, uh, what is saved, what has been burned, who has died. Nobody knew for days. And again, I'm in Italy. I'm thinking I should be in Western Canada where I live. This is the biggest story in a generation. And uh, so I was you know, feeling rueful about that and, and afraid for the people and thought, no, I'm here to write a novel and tried vainly to go back into it. And then um, really just couldn't uh, take my eyes off it in part because the fire didn't pass. The fire burnt in Fort McMurray, not for one or two or three days, but for an entire week. And the, the Great Fire of London lasted for about five days. And houses and entire work camps were burning to the ground in Fort McMurray two weeks later. 2,300 square miles of forest burned in the process. Uh, and again, you know, 90,000 people were evacuated. Um, so, um, I'm looking at this and realizing this is obviously a national story, but I, I really try to write international stories. I'm, I'm interested in kind of universal themes. And the closer I looked at this, when I started looking at the, the behavior of the fire and the conditions under which it occurred, I realized that these are conditions that can be replicated almost anywhere in the world. And again, this was back in 2016, which seems like an almost quaint historic time when we consider the incredibly destructive fires that have burned since then across Greece, uh, even in the UK. Uh, you've had, I think you had the busiest fire day since World War II. And I think it was in 2021 or 2022 during that terrible drought. Uh, but you know, Valparaiso and Chile just literally last week uh, just a, an apocalypse for them. Um, so this is back in 2016. I'm looking at the conditions. And it's, you know, this is the subarctic of Canada. It's a cold place. It's a wet place. And yet it was um, 33 Celsius that day. And really more significant and something that we don't think about uh, was the relative humidity. And it, it was 11%. And that really doesn't have a lot of meaning uh, for most of us. And um, it didn't have a lot of meaning for me until I started looking for places where 11% uh, was normal. And 11% relative humidity is normal in Death Valley in July. And that's how dry it was in Fort McMurray in May. There was ice still on the local lakes. There were car-sized blocks of ice 
on the Athabasca River, which is the main water body that flows through that city. Uh, so basically, Southern California fire conditions were recreated in the boreal forest. Um, and that's a terrifying prospect. And that changes fundamentally how fire behaves. And so I coined a term uh, which is 21st century fire, and it's a different animal. It behaves differently. We've got the same planet, we've got the same sun, we've got the same trees, but when you tweak the heat and you tweak the humidity, that changes the dynamic and creates a space for fire, an opportunity for explosive behavior that simply didn't exist in a lot of places prior. So, on May 3rd, this fire that started quite innocently in the forest um, was unsuppressible by human means. They had water bombers on it. They had hotshot crews. Albertans are very good firefighters, and they could not put this fire out. Um, the temperature and the humidity did not change. It stayed very hot at night, which is one of the characteristics of 21st century fire and really 21st century climate change the temperatures are not dropping at night the way they used to. So it stays warm. And the warmer it is, the easier it is for fire to, to expand. Uh, so we have this um, hot, explosive situation that on May 3rd, with very little provocation, became 100 meter flames across a wall um, about 10 kilometers wide. And so it's really, you have to think something more like a tsunami of flame that swept in to the city of Fort McMurray, which has a lot of suburban settlements on hilltops, the river flowing through it, uh, kind of urbanized downtown. And the, um, you know, these are all things that I really had no idea about when I was going into this story, but, but radiant heat, which is the heat that tells you not to touch the candle flame is energy that moves at the speed of light. And the radiant heat coming out of the forest into the neighborhoods of Fort McMurray was 500 Celsius that day. That's hotter than the planet Venus. And what the heat does, what heat does for fire is it dries out the fuel and then it also causes whatever available hydrocarbons they are, it might be in the trees, it might be in the leaves, it might be in the rubber tires, it might be in the vinyl siding on the side of the houses or the tar shingle roofs or the plastic uh, swing set. It causes the hydrocarbons in those fuels to vaporize. So we're feeling the heat, we're seeing the smoke, we're trying to get out. What the fire is seeing is this, it's almost like an aura. It's this cloud of billowing fuel emanating, not just from the forest, but now from the city itself. And vapor is what fire engages with. Think of a, a gas can exploding. The houses in Fort McMurray, these are two-story, half-million-dollar, state-of-the-art, brand-new homes, burnt from the roof to the basement in five minutes because they were superheated in their entirety to 500 Celsius, vaporizing like crazy. And so everything engaged at once. And firefighters cannot fight that. Human beings have no means at their disposal to uh, uh, combat that. So this is a petroleum town. And what I took me seven years to understand, seven years to write this book, that the petroleum industry is a wholly owned subsidiary of fire. It's kind of a crazy idea. It feels a little bit backwards. But the petroleum industry and all of us too are servants now of fire and our servitude to liquefied fuel over the past 150 years has changed the nature of our atmosphere to the point that fire is now able to burn more broadly, more intensely on planet Earth than at any other time in human history. So the question now is, is fire serving us, enabling us to live these spectacular lives where we have unparalleled mobility, and many of us are able to generate much more wealth because of it, even ordinary people? Or are we serving fire 
and enabling it to pl uh, prosper and flourish in, in fire's terms across the globe more intensely than it ever has. And I think the historical record, the geologic record, will indicate that that fire got the better end of this deal. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, that's in our future somewhere. Right now, what the what the future, what the planet is telling us um, is to pay attention. And, and what, what the petroleum industry has allowed us to do is to think that we don't need nature, to think that we can manipulate it, that we can amp it up or damp it down as we need to. Uh, we can drive in vehicles that insulate it from its uh, us from its effects. Live in homes that insulate us from its uh, various changes and, and fluctuations. And what it is now, you know, what I the message I get from this heating and from these fires is kind of being grabbed by the collar and saying, "I'm out here. I'm impacting. Uh, I'm being impacted by you, and your impacts are now." Um, causing me to uh, impact you in return in ways that, that are not tenable. So, um, you know, the message, the, the kind of the, the obvious message for me is, you know, to decarbonize as, as rapidly as possible. But I was also, um, you know, really resonating to what, what Jackie was saying is, you know, it, major obstacles stand in our way. And yet uh, a friend of mine here uh, from Alberta, uh, in fact, said when, when he became a father, he understood that he was morally obligated to be an optimist. And, and I think going through the world now in an, in an energetic way, in a, in a proactive way, in a positive way, is a practice. It's not sort of a matter of, well, I'm having a good day today, so I guess I'll do something positive. It's really, uh, it's a conscious effort. And um, we also have to remember uh, that that nature's default mode is reverescence. It's it's to flourish, it's to rebound, and it's to regrow. That's what it wants to do. When you stop killing anything, um, it generally rebounds. I learned that when I was writing the tiger. When you stop shooting tigers, they breed like cats, and that's what uh, the living world wants to do: is reproduce itself and. So that's uh, very hopeful to me, and I want to be a part of that. And that's, um, you know, as I've been traveling around with this book, and people are wondering, how do we face this? How do we confront this? Um, there is, there are, uh, along with these really grim uh, indicators from our climate, there are also these incredible gains being made around renewable energy and around the way people are renegotiating their relationships with nature uh, through ag agriculture and forestry and just as a way of being more, uh, living more lightly on the world. And those people are in abundance among us and it behooves us to uh, ally ourselves with them rather than get tangled up with the people who appear to be still wedded to the, an ever bigger truck or um, expanding uh, petroleum operations. And so there's, you know, there's sort of different, there are different pathways we can choose. And it's very easy to get distracted by the negative and overwhelmed by the negative. I love that comment, uh, pessimism is for lightweights, uh, very challenging, and uh, I'm, but I'm exhilarated by it. And, uh, I'm here for it. So thanks so much for your attention and really good to be with you all. John, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I really like that ending. Uh, you're absolutely right. We have to stay really positive. And it's also absolutely true. The speed with which nature can just get its act together when we move out of the space is quite phenomenal. And I, I'm sorry I didn't make reference to your book about tigers, but one's seen that one's seen that extraordinary ability um, that we can't, we'll never stop it. Thank heavens, and we should all be on that side. So, thank you for joining us from your Vancouver morning, and please buy this book. Um, now, our last speaker tonight is Emma Tarlow, who has written a really curious and interesting book that came out of lockdown in the sense that it was while Emma was in lockdown that she started walking in the park 
and she met a couple of guys who lived under trees and who had made a distinct choice that this was how they wanted to live. Emma herself is a <coughs> sorry, an anthropologist, a writer, and a curator, and she's also an emeritus professor at Goldsmiths. She's the author of all sorts of very well-regarded academic titles, but she published a book also called Entanglement, The Secret Lives of Hair in 2016, which many of you may if not have read. I'm sure you've probably heard about it because it's an extraordinary title. Anyway, I'm thrilled that she's joining us, and um, Emma, I know you're going to show certain slides and we may not see a huge amount of you, but I think we will see you right now, hopefully. I am uh, hopefully about right. to appear. Have I appeared? Yes, you have. I have appeared. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction and indeed for inviting me to this event, which is a real pleasure uh, to be part of. Um, now, one of the things that fascinated me when I began to start writing this book, uh, Under the Hornbeams, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, was the question of at what point uh, one's experience becomes a story. Because in a way, I tend to think of everyday life as one giant story that we're all participating in, like a sort of huge, ever-expanding collage with little interlinking stories which might connect or disconnect or enhance or even uh, over, overlay each other, um, but in interesting ways, forming part of this larger fabric. So in the which case, where would any particular story uh, begin and end? But obviously, since a book has to sit between two covers and this talk possibly has to sit within its 15 minute slot, um, then we need to have a beginning and we need to have an end, however much that end may slice into the flow of experience in somewhat artificial ways. So the story I want to tell begins, uh, as we've mentioned, in Regent's Park, and I'm going to share some images with you here and whisk you into the park uh, in April 2020. Now, 2020 was, uh, as, as Rosie mentioned, uh, a time of lockdown. Um, the world has sort of stood still. The, um, the cars and aeroplanes have gone silent uh, momentarily. And the birds seem to be singing louder than ever before. But just as the kind of beauty of the spring seems to be magnified by this sort of slowing down and this quietness, there is also something else which is magnified, which is the kind of anxiety and fear on people's faces. Uh, there is fear in the air and the air itself has become a thing to fear. What might it be carrying? Uh, what happens if you are uh, stand too close to someone jogging past you in the park? Uh, don't breathe too much. Uh, don't inhale. And, and soon, in fact, we will be wearing masks. So as I was wandering around the park, observing this kind of fear, two faces of two men uh, stood out to me very particularly, precisely because they did not exude fear, but actually a kind of calm and magnanimity and curiosity about the world, uh, which was very different from this type of anxiety. And these were the faces of two men, Nick and Pascal, who were living under the trees. Um, and they were living and they've been living there for five years. No tent, no access to fire, no access to light, no money, no security. So none of the props, the basic props really, that most of us would consider the absolute essentials of everyday existence. And yet they were attracting birds, squirrels, field mice, dogs, foxes, and some people who recognized this kind of calm. I'm not homeless, this is my home, Nick tells me shortly into our acquaintance. And he often refers to his life uh, in Regent's Park, living in the open as a privilege. An arrangement without an arrangement is how Pascal refers to their improvisational way of living alongside each other, something they've actually been doing for 20 years now. Nick is now in his late 60s, Pascal in his late 40s. When I asked Nick how they're managing for food, his response, is quite arresting. We manage, he says. People are kind. They bring things. They get something out of it because they feel good about giving. 
And it's good for us because we get to eat the food. So there's a kind of dignity and wisdom and humor in that response. It's not about um, worthy benefactors or, or needy victims, but really about relationships of exchange and mutuality. And I sort of immediately sense that we're likely to get along and we do. So to meet these men living and thinking in the open at a time when so many of us are closed in, kind of locked within our houses, attached to our computers, our work life and social life reduced to the digital, was an incredible breath of fresh air. It was a chance to reconnect to the physicality of life and also to reconsider certain core values, to reassess what matters. What is freedom? What is a home? What is contentment? What happens when we strip away the layers of comfort that we have become so dependent upon? And in what ways are we connected to nature, albeit nature in the city, and to the larger scheme of things? And getting to know uh, Nick and Pascal and seeing them on a daily basis and spending time with them also alerted me to the uh, sort of undetected networks of, of support that were coming in and out of the park that in some ways enabled them to live the life that they were leading. There's Jim, who's a sweeper who works down by the Regent's Canal. And every morning at five o'clock in the morning, Jim would fill up two flasks of hot water and hide them just near to the warthog enclosure of the zoo so that Nick and Pascal have access to hot water during the day. But equally, there's Sandy, an ex uh, film producer who might turn up with banana cake one week or a book by Aldous Huxley or Walter Benjamin or Isaac Babel the next. Books all gratefully received and avidly read and reflected upon. There is also Bakshi seen here with his dog, Lizzie, a rescue dog who's blind. They come every evening, I soon learn, and have been doing so for some years. It's a place to relax and spend time together. And once a week, Batchy will do an online shop to make sure that certain basic things are there for Nick and Pascal. And then there is me, who enters the equation, uh, a university professor struggling with her professional life during the day at a time when things were particularly fractious and political and bureaucratic uh, requirements were, were quite oppressive, uh, finding pleasure in the simple act of cooking uh, home food that I could take to the park, sharing the fruits of my labor with Nick and Pascal, and to sit outside in the open and find that kind of peace that Jackie was talking about earlier under the trees um, and talk uh, openly about anything with people with very open minds. And sometimes it was quite literally the fruits of the park that we were turning around, so to speak. Um, so we had watched um, the crab apples ripen from their tiny little green nuggets to becoming very beautiful sort of golden baubles that you see here. Um, and Nick commented, the parakeets get the ones at the top, the humans get the ones at the bottom, and the ones in the middle are left to rot in a tree, some kind of natural order of things. And when he presents me with a large bag of crab apples, I take them home, convert them into crab apple jelly, and then return them to the park, sort of enjoying the fact that they're returning to their place of origin. And one day when I'm out walking with Nick uh, in the long grass looking for mushrooms, we come across, a, uh, we meet an old man who hasn't seen Nick for a while, but recognizes his, him and, and says with sort of pleasure, you know, how are you? Uh, and Nick says, how do I look? Uh, and the man says, you look very well. And Nick's response is very interesting. He says, I've come to the conclusion that if you have nothing, you actually have everything. How so, the man asks, because it brings out the best in people, is Nick's reply. So to spend time with Nick and Pascal was a chance to step into a world in which capitalism, so incredibly pervasive in our everyday life, somehow felt parochial, if not irrelevant. 
And it was also to enter a world in which um, the trees, the people, uh, animals were seen to exhibit a kind of porosity and in a kind of interactive way. Pascal is rooting himself back into the ground, says Nick of Pascal's hair, which you can see here, um, which if it weren't tied into a, in, into a knot would indeed be sweeping the leaves. Is that tree dancing? I ask Nick, when we're walking along on a cold winter's day, when the leaves have, uh, when the trees have, have discarded their mantle of leaves uh, to reveal the beauty of their bare skeletons. But of course, to be outside all the time is also to endure the weather and everything that it flings at you in a very particular way. And it makes one realize how, how much of one's life is screened from the weather rather than actually being in it. Um, and this might mean standing under umbrellas. And in fact, I took this photo when they'd actually been standing up for 36 hours because it had been persistent rain without stopping, which meant that there was no opportunity to sit down. But the umbrellas are hung in the trees in order to prevent one's arm from getting um, weary. But of course, to be outside also means embracing those moments, such as this moment, just a, an hour of unexpected sunshine in November, a chance to read a book, or in this case, listen to a pocket radio. And being out in all weathers and at all times of day means seeing so much that we very often don't see. The beauty, for example, of this night sky with the moon so delicately caught in the fingertips of the hornbeams. It is also to experience a sort of existential pleasure of disappearance in the mist on a December morning. And of course, it is to experience the hardship of the cold and the frost of winter. All of these things alerted me then to both the beauty and the hardship of existence and taught me to take note and live in the moment and learn the skills of adaptation. It's January 2021, and as you can see, it's snowing. Nick and Pascal have been evicted from the park, or at least threatened with eviction. They have no idea where they're going to sleep tonight. I ask Pascal if he's feeling anxious. Anxiety, he says. Oh, that's a modern condition. These days, people swim in anxiety. They drown in anxiety. But it's not for me. Nick, meanwhile, is enjoying the snow. It's a chance to see the same world differently, he says. When a man walks past, asking if he can interview him about being homeless, he says, I've never thought of myself as homeless. Fancy a snowball fight? And he's off throwing snowballs at a stranger. So whilst I was spending time in the park each day with Nick and Pascal, I did end up keeping some sort of park diary, but it wasn't with the intention of writing a book. It was more to preserve the memory of a very special time. In my mind, I thought that if I ever converted this into a story, it would be something I did perhaps in 20 years time, looking back to the extraordinary moment of the pandemic at the time when I'd met these remarkable men and formed a close friendship with them. But as the year went on and our friendship grew stronger, Nick began to see me as a kind of archivist of their life in the park, encouraging me to document it. And with that extraordinary act of trust, uh, my experience began to transform from an experience into the story, which is the book under the hornbeams. And I decided to frame the book through the seasons because if you're living outside, your life is so shaped by the seasons. So returning from April to April seemed like a, a natural cutoff point, even if in many ways it's utterly unnatural because our relationship continues and extends well beyond those dates and into the present. They participated in the writing of the book in various ways, in particular by adding eight pages at the end in which they thank approximately 100 people for different things that they have done for them over the years or brought them. And these make very interesting reading because they also show the, the, the webs of sociality uh, in which they participate. So I'm just going to return. Oops. 
for a moment, just for a last moment. So Under the Hornbeams is basically a story that I walked into. And among the many lessons it taught me was the enchantment that exists all around us is often in the everyday and that everything in life may potentially become a story. So I suppose my question would be to you, what story do you want to tell and has it already begun? Thank you for listening. Wow, that was so wonderful. What a wonderful story. It's so beautifully told. Um, gosh, I, the photo, did you take all the photographs? So yes, they're photographs I took, except for the one of me, which Nick took. <laughs> we okay. were just they're, they're, really, well. yes. they're really yeah. great. They're really yeah, great. Thank, thank you. you so much for sharing that story with us. I feel very buoyed up by that. It's uh, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful note to end on. Thank you all for being so absolutely great. Jackie, Paula, um, John and Kathy, if you're all still here, um, thank you very, very much for sharing the stories with us for this last hour. And thank you all to all of you listening at home and to whoever picks it up on the podcast, which I know lots of you do. Um, do join us next week. We've got a 5 by 15, the fourth panel in our series with Q, where we're going to be looking at the colonial origins of and the history of botanic gardens, because at the end of the day, colonialism and gardening are uh, one and the same bedfellow. And we're going to be with Andrea Wolfe, and the wonderful Sathnan Sangera talking about both of their incredible books. And then the following week, we're hosting the Writer's Prize and Alex Clark will be talking to Naomi Klein and Zadie Smith, among others. All the details are on our website. It's lovely to see you all as ever. And I certainly have got lots and lots of things to think about tonight and books to read. And I hope that you do too. So until the next time we see you, good night and thank you for joining us. <laughs>